Matthew 6, 19, we read, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's, let's ask the Lord to bless. Heavenly Father, again, we come before your throne asking, Lord, that you would bless your word. Lord, that you would... Just uh, fill our hearts and minds with the, with the Holy Spirit that you've given to us at salvation, that we might hear from you and be receptive to your word, and Lord, strengthened by it, and, and, and our faith increased, that we might honor and glorify you and enjoy the relationship that you desire to have with us. So bless your word tonight, Lord, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the thanks, for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're, we're going to look at, really, a, a word just about storing up treasures, and God's for that, right? Sometimes I think people think, oh, God doesn't want us to store treasures up, but, but He does. And believe it or not, we're going to understand, I think, in a little bit better of a way, the relationship that God has given to us as believers. If we really know the relationship, it, it will set our hearts on fire uh, in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, again, I, I want to just look at a couple of, of things here concerning or a word or two about storing up treasures in, in heaven, what God has for us. And uh, God's not against storing up treasure. In fact, He encourages it. That's a good thing, right? So first of all, we want to stop and think about what is a treasure? That's a good question, right? What is a treasure? Well, a treasure is something of value that will increase in value. Right? You don't want to have a treasure and it depreciate or decrease in value. So this is something that requires an investment upon our part, right? There's an investment that's made on our part. But when it comes to a treasure, it's, it should have value today that will hold tomorrow and have value forever. That's a real treasure, right? There are treasures that people seek on this side of eternity that are temporal that will, that will be done. The value of those treasures will be over after, after this, this life. But if, the, if those treasures, by the way, we can, we can store up certain treasures and use those treasures to gain other treasures. That'll confuse you, right? So you'll get, gain treasures that you'll be able to invest. So, so we, we invest some of our treasures in the Word of God, in the ministry of God, and those go out and they get multiplied when souls are saved, right? When people's lives are changed and strengthened for the Lord Jesus Christ, those things begin to have eternal value, right? And that, that's an important, important thing. So uh, we understand what a treasure is, and a treasure is, is an abundance also of something that is in itself, at least in, in our opinion, precious and valuable and likely to stand the test of time. That's, that's a true value. You know, you, you look at today, and I don't know if you've ever watched the road show. I don't even know if that show's still on, but years ago they had the road show, and, and people would just find stuff in their attic or something that was left to them, and, and they, they just would bring it up to these people, and they would appraise them, right? They would tell you what they were worth. Sometimes they really had something, sometimes they really didn't. And what was really neat was when they thought, well, I thought maybe it was worth a couple of $100, and then it ended up being worth a few thousand dollars or more, right? Uh, or some people thought they had something that was really worth a lot, and it really wasn't. <laughs> and so you don't, want to be, you don't want to find yourself in that kind of a situation. But God wants us to invest in things uh, that have great value. So look at verse 19. He says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. So God is concerned 
with treasures. What's he concerned about? Well, he's concerned about where we keep our treasures. So first of all, he tells us what a treasure really is. And then he, he wants us to understand where we're to keep um, the treasure. So the storage or the location is very important to God. Why is that? Why would the location or, or the storage of our treasures be important to God? Well, God wants our treasures to be protected. He doesn't want them to just disappear because really when you stop and think about it, the treasure that we store up represents our life. You ever stop to think about what we have, what we consider to be uh, our treasure is our life. Some people, uh, are, their treasures are in the stock market. And unfortunately, at the end of life, they'll get burned up. They'll be, they'll be gone. And it's not that God doesn't want us to have monetary treasure. But what we, what we really value will really represent what, what we were living for, what our life was all about. And God wants us really to protect our treasure so that it doesn't get corrupted or spoiled. Uh, no one likes to find things that, that are spoiled. Look again at verse 19. He says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. So he's concerned, really, where we store our treasure and where we keep our treasures, Right? Some people have a different idea of what treasures are. And, you know, all different uh, ages and stages of life, we, our, our treasures kind of change, don't they? And, uh, and so when we're little, we treasured certain things. And, and, you know, some of those things, when I was growing up as a kid, if I'd have kept them, they'd, they'd have been worth something. There was a, there was a G.I. Joe doll, right? Action figure, G.I. Joe. It was different than what you see today. I mean, they were, they were about this big. One year, I never saw it. One year, they made, they made a G.I. Joe nurse. It was a nurse. And I never saw it, but they said she was hideous looking. She didn't look, she, you know, very pretty or anything. But uh, back in the 90s, I, there was one guy who had a show that said, I'll buy that too. It was a radio program, and he would go around, he would connect people that were collectors, and they would buy those things. And, uh, and that doll valued at over $2,500 uh, for this G.I. Joe doll. Th that's because somebody uh, uh, figured it was worth it. It was a collector's item to them. Uh, another guy was on the, on the fishing pier, and his grandpa had given him a wooden fishing lure. And he was throwing that out there, casting that out there, and, and, uh, and, and one guy that was a collector noticed that, and, uh, and he said, do you know that every time you throw that lure out there, you're throwing about $1,800 out there? Every time you throw that lure out there, and, uh, and, and he bought it. He said, he's, that guy reeled in his lure, and cut him. here you go, sold it for $1,800. He, this fella collected those things. You know, God collects things from our life also, right? He collects our prayers. He collects our tears. He collects our love right? You know, those are valuable to God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that something wonderful? I, I, I want to share an important truth with you tonight, but I, I want to go over a couple of things first, and then I'm going to finish off with, with I think, an important truth that will give us all a, a wonderful understanding of what God has given to us in salvation. That's what changes everything when we understand uh, that relationship. But back to storing treasures, right? You know, when you have four kids, I'm not telling on my kids too badly anyway, tonight, right? And you go out to eat somewhere and, you know, you, you have something that you really enjoy that you don't get to eat too much of. And, and you bring it home and you act real dignified in the restaurant, you know, a little box to go home. And you, and you take it in the car. But... but but see, they, they understand something. They, they understand the law of the refrigerator. And that when you put that item in the refrigerator, this is mine. You can say it all day long, right? But if you take a nap on a Sunday afternoon, <laughs> it might be fair game, right? Well, you've got to be really creative in hiding your treasure, and, and you know what? I give credit to all of my kids for being really creative. Do you know those hiding places that you can't even find? And then months will go by, 
And then all of a sudden, in between two drawers on the side somewhere, you know, behind some packaging or something like that, all of a sudden it's like mold that comes out, right? They hit it so well, they hit it from themselves, right? Nobody found it, really. Nobody found it, and they didn't get to enjoy it either. So there's an extreme of hiding your treasures, right? And, and, and you don't want it to spoil. And so, so God really wants us to hide our treasures to where it will benefit us, right? Okay, so God doesn't want us to store any of our treasures on earth because they won't last. It's not that we can't have earthly treasures, but the best of treasures are heavenly treasures, right? The greatest treasure that you and I possess that will gain us more treasures are, is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the best treasure that we have. And I want to tell you an important truth tonight about that treasure that you possess in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we do that, verse 20, we find that God's recommended location for our treasure is in heaven. And, and why is that in heaven? Look at verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So God's for storing up treasure where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So we find that God chooses heaven because uh, that's eternal. Not only that, but... It, Everything on earth will eventually be done away with. It will, it, it will be taken care of by the moths, by man, or ultimately by fire. It, it will all be gone. So, so the world's treasure really um, is something that is very temporal and a lot of times weighs us down to where we really um, aren't living for the things that bring life. They, they become a weight that slow us down in our pursuit of God. So they're not really a treasure at all, but there, there are many believers that are being weighed down by things that, is, that, that are keeping them from drawing close to the Lord. And so God's concerned about uh, where the location of our treasure is at. If it's not in heaven, then maybe there are things that we're looking to or, evaluate, or putting value on that, that are hindering our, our walk. Verse 21, we find that God is concerned with what we treasure because what we treasure governs our heart. Look at verse 21. For where your treasure is or what you value, uh, there will your heart be also. So in heaven, nothing will corrupt our treasure or our heart. The heart follows the treasure as the needle on a compass points to north. You ever, see the, you ever watch a sunflower in the daytime, right? It follows the sun, doesn't it? That, that, that sunflower will follow the direction uh, of the sun. So where the treasure is, there also where our value system be or what we esteem and, and the things that we love and our affections will follow after, after those things as well. So, so tonight, let me ask you this question. How is your compass working, right? How is it functioning? How, what, what is governing your, your compass? If, if you go to a certain area... Is it true north? If uh, somewhere up in the Alaska area, the, the pilots don't use their compass because it, it's, it's, it doesn't point in the right direction, right? They'll, they'll lose their, their direction. And so I forget how they navigate there, but there's a problem with the compass in, in that particular area. And we want to make sure that we don't have an issue with that. So let's find out. Let's take a compass test, right? Go over to the book of Colossians, verse or chapter 3, verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, and here's a compass test, right? Colossians 3, verse 1. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's where our life is at, with Christ in God. Then he says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So he says the life of the believer is hid with the Lord Jesus Christ in God. That's a good place to be. And I want to share with you something here. Can I build up to this here? Um, what, what was done to give us that relationship 
with, with Jesus Christ, all right? But we're going to still have our, our compass test here. Go over to the book of Proverbs, chapter 18. This will be the last um, compass test, if you will. And then we'll go back over to Matthew, chapter 6, just for a moment. Proverbs 18, and look at verse 10. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous runneth into it and is safe. That's a safe place. That's a safe keeping, isn't it? What are we concerned about there? Our soul is what we put value on. And so he says the, the, the righteous run to the Lord. To, that, that's their strong tower, and we're safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and as a high wall in his own conceit. The, the worldly individual, right, is, is, is looking to this. And then he says, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility. Did you see the contrast? No, notice that again. Before destruction, the heart, the heart of man is haughty. It's puffed up. It's lifted up. It's, it's, it's conceited. It's self-centered, Right. So you can mark down, when you see somebody who is self-centered, they're displaying a haughty heart, the fall is going to come, all right? Um, a, a lot of people in, in our uh, political arena are very arrogant. They make some bold statements. A lot of them have eaten crow, haven't they? They've, they've, really, they've really eaten, I, I, I'll not name names, but there was one person in the, in the 20. 12 election that said, oh, gas will never go below 250. He called another candidate a fool because gas will never go below 250. He was so sure because gas was at three something a gallon that it wouldn't even go below $3 a gallon. In fact, they, I think they were hoping it would go to be seven to $9 a gallon, the same prices over at Europe, right? In Europe. Well, I'm glad I don't live in, in Europe. You know, I can't imagine paying seven to $9 a gallon um, for gas. And in fact, they're, they're, they're uncovering more. But before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. So the Lord is concerned about where, where our compass, how our compass is, is functioning. Go back with me over to the book of Matthew, and, and we'll finish uh, this, this section right here. Matthew chapter um, 6, and let's look at verse 20, 22 and 23, in fact, 24. And he, he talks about the eye being single, or the hapluis, which literally means free from obstruction, free from anything that would be hindering the, the vision. Look at verse 22 in Matthew chapter 6. It says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, or, or, or free from obstruction, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil or has an obstruction in it or is, is distracted by something, right? And of course, something evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, he says, how great is, the, is that darkness. Then look how he finishes this. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So there's a relationship there, right? Now I'm going to invite you over to the book of Romans, chapter 7, and, and show you something that I, I think you'll find powerful, all right? I, I, I did. I hope you do as well. Um, it, it definitely encouraged me in my walk with the Lord. And, we, and when we realize this, we'll see more of what was done for us at salvation, all right? So, so here's Here's what Paul is speaking to us through the Holy Spirit. Look at, look at verse 1. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of, of her husband. Now here's the situation. Paul is trying to really explain to the believer the relationship that they have in, in the Lord Jesus Christ and what was given to them. I mean, boy, I tell you, uh, if you back up a little bit, you'll see uh, in, in, um, 
in, in chapter 6, he talks about knowing in, in, in verse 6. He says, knowing this, and then again in verse 9, knowing, knowing that Christ, what he did. And in verse 3, he says, know ye not. So he's saying, really, that ignorance is the key ingredient to hindering, the, to set the life free of a believer, right? Ignorance on our part holds us back and holds us down from understanding the freedom that has been purchased for us, what really took place when we have been set free by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to explain something to you. So Paul is using the relationship of marriage, and this is important, because when we were born, we were born under the first Adam. You know what we were married to? We were married to the law. That was, that's what we were married to, all right? The law was the schoolmaster in, in, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 4. It talks about the schoolmaster, but we, we won't get into that. But I want you to see what Paul is, is talking and trying to explain here to, to every believer. So, so Paul is saying that, that when you cannot, you cannot be separated, <clears throat> you cannot be di divorced, because if the woman goes out after she's been divorced and marries somebody else, she has committed adultery. Now, God is using this truth to explain our relationship, what happened with us, right? And so, so here's the thing. We have been married to the law, and the law is killing us, right? And so he's explaining that in order for us to have a different spouse, um, the, the, the other spouse has to die. The only problem with that is that the law will never die. I'll say that again. The law will never die. It's settled forever. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. That is the word of God. So we're kind of in a, in a pickle here, right? In order to move over to our new spouse, um, the, our spouse has to die. And, but the law is never going to die. So how is that going to happen? How is that transfer if we're really going to be free? Because the only thing the law does is condemns us, right? It tells us we're guilty, and that's all we can say. Guilty is charged. I'm, I'm guilty. So watch this powerful truth as it unfolds here with that thought in mind. Look at, look at verse 1 again in Romans chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Okay, so we're, we're, there's no bones about it. We're talking about the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So as long as we're alive, the law has dominion, right? And he asks that question. For the woman, he makes this statement, for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her. To her husband, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, so he's giving us the, the way out. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. But here's the problem. Remember, the law's not going to die. What are we to do? Look at verse 3. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Can't leave. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. But we already said the law is not going to die, right? So watch what happens here. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised up from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Notice this, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, sins, plural, which were by the law, did work on our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. How? That being dead, wherein we were held, we should not serve the, the I'm sorry, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of, of the letter. Why? Because we died in the Lord Jesus Christ. The law didn't die. We died in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we died in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now free to belong to another. We have been freed from the law of sin and death by the death, burial, and resurrection. We identified with the Lord Jesus Christ when we received the sacrifice that was made on our behalf and that separated us and imputed unto us or reckoned unto us, or put into our account the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the death had to take place first. Do you follow that? That is, that is revelating, that is an eye-opener of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for every child that belongs to Him. 
We have been literally set free. So we don't, we, listen, we, 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 we lift up the beggarly elements, if you will, to bring up the law as our standard. Or to think in our, and listen, this is a hard breakaway. It, it's kind of like, I don't know how to, how to, some people get into abusive situations and they find themselves continually getting in abusive situations. They're kind of drawn to those things. Some people actually feel good getting beat up. <laughs> I don't know. What I mean by that is, you know, they need somebody to, 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 to harp on them or to be down. And that's not a good way to live. And that's not the way God wants us to live. And, but we have the bad habit in our nature to say, oh, I'm failing God here. I'm, and, and God says, wait a minute. When I look at you, I see the righteousness of my son. Amen. See, our motive for service is not because we shouldn't do these things and we shouldn't do those things. Our motive for serving is the love of Christ now. Amen. So I don't have, listen, you are accepted in the beloved no matter what. Otherwise, you're not believing in grace. Stop and think about that. The only reason why you have any merit before God is because of the grace of God in your life. You've been forgiven, and you've been given the grace of God in your life. Isn't that a good truth? That, that's, that's a powerful truth. And so, so Paul is wanting the believer to understand that they have been given something that, that they had never been given before. And so look at, uh, you're right here in the book of Romans. Go to Romans chapter 8. Look at, look at verse 11. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Why? Because of, because of how well you've performed in keeping or not keeping or, or doing or not doing the things that God has asked you to do? No. But by the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we grasp a handle that our acceptance before God is because of his righteousness, we have no fear. When we realize that what we have in Christ is because of what he's given to us, we're accepted of him. We can sometimes feel like we're worthless, but that's not how God sees us. And again, I say that we, we can know that because he gave us his son while we were yet sinners, right? While we were, while we were still in the mire, he, he saw that and he said, I'm willing to pay the price because I love you. Now, I'll never understand that. I don't even know if in eternity I'll understand that. I will experience that. I will be the recipient of that. I will enjoy that. But I don't know if I can ever understand why he did that. Other than he loves me. I do understand that part. But why he chose me and why he chose you, I don't know if we'll... But that's a, it's a grand thing, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what I'm afraid we do oftentimes. We don't feel worthy to come before the Lord. We don't feel worthy to, to ask him for this, that, or the other because we feel like we failed him. But he, said, but he says, that's not why I've accepted you. I have, accept, I have accepted you because I have accepted my son. And the righteousness of my son has now been placed in your account. And that's what the Lord sees. Our minds don't grasp that. You know why? Because, because our minds are geared we have, to, we, have to, we have to understand the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit has to reveal that to us, and that's what, where we begin to be set free. It's a process. We, we, we are in our, I don't know that we realize, maybe I'm just telling on myself, but I don't know if we realize how powerful the old nature is to, in the way that we think. We think so many times that, that, that God is wanting us to perform and live up to certain things. And because you're a Christian, you ought to do this and you ought to do that and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And oftentimes that's how we grade ourselves, but that's not how God sees us. Grace sets the believer free and, 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 and makes the believer accepted by our, by our God, our Creator, our Savior. What a liberating, you are under grace now. And, and, and here, ready? Here's, here's what our mind thinks. 
And Paul dealt with it in Romans chapter 4. Oh, well, then I guess that's license to sin then. I can just live however I want to. Well, not if the Spirit of God is working. Not if, not if we really understand. We, we, we become jealous of that relationship where we want to guard it and protect it, that nothing would interfere. That's the only, what, what sin does is it interferes with the love of God. And, and, and in other words, on our part of being recipients and, and, and having that open communication and that open experience with God uh, when, when we allow sin to enter in. And by the way, um, here, here's the thing. When God is, is really at work, when we're really talking to God and asking Him, Oh God, Your will be done in my life. He really does give us the, the power to overcome the temptations that would draw us away. It's Him doing it. It's him doing it. You remember what Peter said over there in Acts chapter 3? Men of Israel, why do you look upon us as though by our own power we've done this thing to, to the lame man and made him rise up and walk? We didn't do it. Jesus did it. But they're the ones that said it, didn't they? Do you see? That's how God works in our life. God gives us the victory. God gives us the power. Do you, now, let's go back a little bit. I don't know if I brought this out this morning. But do you, you remember, everything was brand new to Peter. And Peter was kind of like this guy that, that was like, let's see how far we can go. That's a good thing. We, we, we find, oh, Peter, you're doing it again. But listen, Peter experienced things that the other disciples didn't experience, good and bad. But he learned from them some powerful truths, right? So the good part was, Lord, bid me to come. And he got to walk on the water for a little bit. But you'll notice he never asked the Lord to do that again. But God still continued to bless him and use him like he did in healing this, this man that was, that was, that was uh, unable to walk. And now he's leaping and, and walking and praising God. So, so God was doing something in Peter and giving him an understanding, right? What was the other understanding? Oh, Lord, though I'll forsake you, I won't. Boy, what a lesson that one was. But wasn't it for his good? Uh, Peter, listen, I want you to know something. Satan has desi desired to sift you as wheat. You're going to deny me three times. Say, but I prayed for you, and, and you're going to come back. And don't you know when it... Listen, when, when, when Peter came back into that relationship with the Lord, that, by the way, he never lost. But when God brought him into rights... What was, what was the thinking in Peter? Just like Jesus said... So you know what? I got in front of God by saying what I would do and, and completely did not understand that it's Christ in me that does the will of God. So what I have to do is I have to step back and stop getting in God's way so that he can do in me and through me his will. Now, Peter didn't have that because, again, we're not talking about sinless perfection because if you'll remember, he had that confrontation with Paul because he was, he was amongst, you know, the, the Gentiles and, and the, there was the Jewish people there. And then when, when the Jewish people were there, um, you know, he was expecting them to carry out the Jewish law. But then when they weren't, he was, he was living a dual life and Paul confronted him with that. So Peter did have some other issues that he dealt with. But ultimately, here's what Peter learned. Ready? It's Christ in me that gives me the victory. It's as I allow God to, to, Lord, your will be, here, ready? Listen, here's how it works. Lord, I'm asking that your will be done in my life. I am not asking you, God does not want, God does not want us to ask him to help us do your will. He wants to do his will in us without our help. In other words, we come to God and we say, I can't. We're in good ground. I need you, God, to do it in me. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you this. I, I know I say this quite often, but I'm, I'm telling you, I'm saying it because in my thinking, it, it took me, it's taken me a long time to get this. We hear it, we hear it, but when the light bulb comes on, God is asking us to get out of the way. He's not asking us for our help because then we fail. And then we fail, and then it brings us to a low place thinking that we failed God. Or, even worse, we succeed, and then we pat ourselves on the back. God is wanting us to step aside and say, God, I can't do it. That's a good place to be. I need you to do it in me. So then when he does do it, what do we do? We praise his name. Because we know our failure. 
we know our inability. And here's a wonderful truth. When we, when, we, when we step out of the way and say, God, I can't do it. I need you to do it in me. And he does it. It draws us closer. Oh, what a savior. It causes us to worship him and to love him and to realize that he's willing to use an old sinner like me to glorify his name. And so if, if that will give you a revelation, we have been separated from the law by the grace of God because we were placed into that death and burial and resurrection as, as Romans chapter 4 brings out. And, and, and that's what separated us from the law and put us into Christ. If you'll read the book of Romans with that thought in mind, Paul was going line upon line, repeating it from this angle, repeating it from that angle, repeating it from this angle, and making real big about the spirit and the relationship that was given by God. The spirit of God in us and the relationship that God gave us that made all the difference in the world. Why did, why did, Paul, why did God use Paul to do that? Because we are so stubborn. I'll say me. You, you may not, be, but I am so stubborn to think that I've got to do my part. And I will fail every time. And, 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 then, and then what happens is, is if I succeed for a little while, it goes to my head. Oh boy, I'm, 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 you know, when you do what I'm doing, you'll be right with God. And if you're not doing what I'm not, what I'm, if you're not doing what I'm doing, guess what I start to think? You're not right with God. Am I the only one that thinks that way? <laughs> Don't tell me if I am. <laughs> but here it is. But here's the, here's the truth. We do that. That's our nature. If, if, if we're, oh, we say, oh, yeah, everybody has different convictions, blah, 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 blah. That's what it is. It's a bunch of baloney. Because the nature says, no, 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 really, if you're really in tune with God, you'll, be, you'll have the same standards. You'll do the same things that I do. And that's, that's legalism. That's the law. That's not how God wants us to work. When, when, when we're really set free, we're enjoying our relationship so much we want to help others enjoy it. We don't want, we don't want to bring them. Did you, know, you notice? I'm not try, I've not told you one time what you should or you should not be doing. Do you know why? God will take you there. Did you hear what I said? God will take you there by His Spirit. If you do it because somebody's told you to, forget it. It's, it, it's the flesh. It'll never work. If you allow God to bring you there, and if you'll remember Moses, 80 years, and he was just getting a handle on it. And I told you earlier, I'm in good company, right? 30 years I've been saved, and only the last year and a half I'm starting to get this in my head, right? But I'm glad that it's today and, and not sometime down the road. I'm glad, you know why? Because it's liberating. It is, it is freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, the, is our righteousness. He is our life. He is the lover of our soul. He is the one that cares for us. And He is the one that's our victory. It's not in us. We get so worried about what we should be doing or what we shouldn't be doing and all we have to do is just love the Lord. In fact, all we have to do is ask God to help us, to empower us to love him, and he brings it to pass. See, we are, God, well, you know what God really wants us to understand? We are, we are so much in need of him. In fact, we need him to, to, to empower our lives, and, and, and we need him to open up our understanding so that we could be set free. I mean, it, it, is, it is an amazing concept to realize Jesus Christ is our all in all. It is, it is so, whew, it's not in me. I like that. That, lets, that, that. that lightens up. the. Didn't Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my yoke is light? Was he just spitting words out? Do you, do you know, probably the first 28 years of my salvation have probably been the most difficult years of my life where I was sweating. 
and where I was working and where I was trying and where I was frustrated and where I was really, I'm thinking, this is a life burden? Oh, but wait a minute. Oh, how I love Jesus and everything's wonderful and I'm just failing left and right because I'm, I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to be, you know, the example. No, Christ is the example. Isn't that wonderful? And God is the one who's the savior of my soul and the lover of my soul and my life. And when we grasp a handle on that, boy, it's like, it's like the prison bars have been opened. And, we, and for the first time, we can unfurl the wings and soar in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God says, really, be free in him. We can't do it ourselves. And, and the more we taste of that freedom, we want more. We want more. And so, boy, I tell you what. I hope tonight you've understood something that drew you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the recipients of mercy and salvation. God wants to add the bonus of grace that we don't deserve that gives us that new life in him. We just have to ask him, God, I, I, we just have to say, okay, God, I'm done with my effort. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you to do, take over and show me and be everything for me. And God says, all right. <laughs> That's what I've been waiting for. Don't miss out. Enjoy, enjoy your salvation in Jesus. Would you stand? As we prepare for an invitation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, the understanding, Lord, that you give to us, that it's all in you, not in ourselves, not any part of it is in us. All we do, Lord, is just drag things down and Lord, uh, find out quickly how insufficient we are and how, how unable we are. And Lord, if we'll just stop and turn it all over to you, it's then that you begin to do your work. And Lord, for the lack of a better word, begin to amaze and wow us in our relationship with you and in you and to you. Lord, speak to hearts as only you can. May we just surrender all and come just as we are and allow you to do the work you want to do in our lives, in our hearts, and in our minds. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.